everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be here today. Uh, and I'm happy that you all got up so early this morning, given that most people probably started having dinner at about 10 p.m. last night. Um, what a wonderful town, you know, such a beautiful location here in Bilbao and uh, throughout the whole Basque country in Spain. It's really good to be here. Today I want to talk about um, the state of open source and the state of the Linux Foundation. What I can tell you about the Linux Foundation, I'll kind of get that part over first, is things are going amazingly well. Our biggest challenge is hiring smart people to come in and help facilitate all of the collective development that happens across the uh, now thousands of open source projects that we steward. Uh, and you know, at the Linux Foundation, we have uh, a phrase that everybody talks about all the time, sort of our cultural phrase, humble, helpful, hopeful. The humility has to come from the fact that Every day in our communities, roughly 800,000 developers work on all the different projects that uh, are housed at the foundation. Um, and we depend on facilitating that work for the outcomes and impact of the organization and of these open source projects. And uh, almost all of those people are not Linux Foundation employees. So if you don't have humility, you really can't work uh, to influence outcomes, because you know, if ego gets in the way, you can't sort of lead through influence. So that's something important to us. Being helpful is just, hey, you know, the rock stars of open source or the developers and technologies is just that create this great code and standards, uh, and we're just here to facilitate. So you know, what can we do to be helpful to create good developer experiences? Maybe to help with documentation, to bring new people into the community, and so forth. The final part, the hopeful part, is what I think is most important. Because, you know, in the open source community, we tend to uh, like a good crisis, right? Oh, no, you know, like there's, you know, there's a licensing crisis. What are we going to do about AI and open source? And, you know, uh, the sky is kind of always falling, falling. And, you know, oh, you're never going to be able to do that. This open source thing's not going to work. Uh, and if you're not hopeful, you know, it's just really hard to kind of stick with it and have the grit and determination to get these amazing outcomes. And so today I want to talk about some things that, you know, we've all been talking about in the open source community where we're a little worried that something uh, terrible is happening. You know, uh, I think one of these things are around licensing, one of these things are around AI, and uh, the first one I want to talk about is around licensing. How many people here have heard about the recent license change of Terraform uh, there you go. See, this is my crowd. You're all my peeps. <laughs> like, how many people here know this sort of niche uh, open source licensing conversation? Uh, so uh, HashiCorp, a commercial company, recently changed the license of uh, a very popular open source project, Terraform, from an open source license, the MPL2, to a non-open source license, a, a, essentially a business license. Uh, and there's been a lot of... Uh, chatter in the community that, oh my goodness, the sky is falling. And I would like to offer a counterpoint to this, which is, I don't really think the sky is falling because HashiCorp changed their uh, license to a business license. You know, I think the community and industry are just getting more mature, and you're going to see today how actually the sky isn't falling, it's just getting sunnier. You know, HashiCorp, it's their business decision to you know, change the license for the copyright that they own, and uh, they're a reasonable company. I think some people might argue with that given this change, but you know, it's, at the end of the day, it is essentially their business decision. And when I saw all this chatter in my news feeds and from our staff, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's this huge shift from open to these business licenses out there. We've got to do something. I kind of looked into it, and I, I asked the team, you know, find me every single example that you can find of a commercial company that owned the copyright in a popular open source project that changed it from an open source license to a commercial license. And this was the list they came up with. What do we got here? Nine total. Now, for all of you open source wonks out there, I truly challenge you to add to this list, please. But what this is telling us is out of the thousands of critical open source projects out there, out of the hundreds of thousands of long tail projects out there that people use every day, 
is this really that big of a thing? And the answer is probably, hmm, not so much. And the even better answer is that the community and the license agreements in open source provide a good way to adapt to this change. But I do think there's one thing that you should all know as to why does this seem to be happening recently? You know, a lot of these are 2021, 2023. Why, is, why are we all of a sudden kind of seeing this thing? The likely answer is about five, six years ago, seven years ago, there was a lot of private equity and invest, venture investing in open source. Venture capitalists looked for popular open source projects and went to the maintainer, let's start a company off of this, and a lot of capital was raised and people went to market. Using open source is a way to go to market. It's a great way to go to market, right? We all know that, right? More usage begets more interest. And, you know, that enables you to uh, go and sell commercial products in conjunction with the open source project, and that's a good go-to-market strategy. Well, now most of those companies are, are maturing. They might have hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. The company has grown significantly. They're maybe looking at going public, and they're starting to look at their business and try and make decisions about, hey, was that open source thing good or not on an ongoing basis for us? And, and that's kind of it. And it's their prerogative to do so. I think from the Linux Foundation's perspective, it's a further evolution of how users of open source software and co-developers of open source software need to better educate themselves on the risk of a centrally owned copyright regime from a single company that gives them the ability to change a license later on. And I think Dirk Rowell, a European researcher, did a good job of kind of describing this, right? You know, if you look in the uh, upper corner there, this sort of vendor-owned open source, you have uh, open license but you don't really have open governance, right? And that allows for this sort of switch to a business license later uh, because you don't have this neutral uh, open governance. What I think we're seeing is a good lesson for all of us that this upper right corner, the idea of both open governance and an open source license is really the sweet spot that enables commercial organizations to invest in the code base because they know, you know it's not going to be switched, it's not going to be owned by a single entity, and that, uh, in particular, if it's housed at a neutral uh, organization like the Linux Foundation or the many open source uh, foundations uh, that are out there, we're not the only game in town, that, you know, but if it's in a nonprofit foundation, that's really the sweet spot. They're not going to change the license, you know you can trust it, you know you can co-invest, and that's what gets the best outcomes. And so that sweet spot, once HashiCorp changed their license, almost immediately flung into action via a well-known method in open source, which is the right to fork. And that right to fork coincided with that open governance, and that is what we want to talk to you all about today. We have an announcement for a new project called Open Tofu. This is, that's right. This is a drop-in replacement for Terraform. It's open source. It is neutrally housed at the Linux Foundation uh, and hits that sweet spot of open source and open governance. And here to tell you more about this is an Open Tofu core contributor, Sebastian Sadel. Come on out, Sebastian. <laughs> All right, exciting times. Um, so hi, my name is Sebastian Stadel. Um, I'm one of the core contributors on the Open Tofu project, and um, and I'll talk a little bit a little bit about that. Um, first of all, it's just so hard to believe that all of this started just five weeks ago. It feels like it's been an eternity. Uh, just five weeks ago, um, uh, the, uh, a bait and switch was pulled uh, or a rug pull was was made, and uh, and so that got the community into action. And uh, in, in the space of five weeks, we've had hundreds and hundreds of developers pledge to uh, contribute to the project, 150 plus companies. We've got 41,000 stars on GitHub between the manifesto that really resonated with folks, as well as the, the fork itself, we just opened just, uh, just a week and a half ago. 
And uh, it's, uh, it's been trending on GitHub as the between number one and number three project for weeks now. It's one of the fastest growing open source projects um, in the cloud space. Um, and so we're incredibly excited about the momentum and getting the community going on, on the project. And um, it's not just uh, individuals and developers like myself that are, that, that, that are excited about this. Uh, it's, also, uh, it's also enterprises. And, uh, and so enterprises have, uh, you know, they make large uh, investments into open source, and we're continuing to see that. So here to talk a little bit more about their usage of open source and, and their excitement for open tofu is uh, David Beha. Uh, please welcome him. So David Rahal is the uh, head of software engineering at Alliance, and uh, could you introduce yourself yeah. a little bit? Um, heading software engineering in Alliance Indonesia. For those of you that don't know, Alliance is an insurance a multinational company. We are the third largest uh, insurance in the world, according to Forbes. And uh, in particular in Indonesia, we are the number one in the market in life and health insurance business. And uh, you were telling me backstage that you guys use a lot of open source. Can you tell us a little bit about how important open source is to, to the company? Yeah. So uh, Alliance purpose is uh, we secure your future. When it comes to take uh, IT strategic decisions, we always ask ourselves, how is this going to secure uh, our, uh, our customer's future? Open source tends to be, most of the times, the, the right answer to that question. That's why many of our business critical applications run entirely on open source. And uh, you were telling me as well that you guys are huge Terraform users, right? You've got it deployed across many applications, many business units, et cetera. So, so Terraform and infrastructure as code in general is super important to you guys. Can, can you tell us a little bit yeah. more uh, well, about that? Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to securing the future of our customers, IT operations is uh, business critical, is, is critical for them. Um, uh, it, uh, doing infrastructure as code provides us with uh, uh, resilience and agility that is much needed, particularly for us in Indonesia, living in the ring of fire, you can imagine. Uh, IT operations is, <laughs> is critical for securing, the, securing our customers. And we, we had invested millions of euros in, in developing uh, Terraform code. So when, when there was this change of license, we were wondering, uh, is this still the, the, the right way to secure the future of our customers. But uh, now with the announcement of OpenTofu, we are so happy to, to join and to pivot to OpenTofu. It's great to have you in the community. Thank you so much. Let's give him, thank you. Um, quick show of hands. Here, who, who here has heard of or uses ExpressVPN? It's amazing to see. Uh, here to talk a little bit more about uh, OpenTofu as well, let's welcome Carlos Clemente. He's a staff platform engineer at ExpressVPN, and uh, he'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the work they do. Please give him a warm welcome. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so yeah, um, I'm Carlos Clemente. I work in ExpressVPN as a platform engineer. And in ExpressVPN, we value the, our customers' privacy and the right to, well, be, <clears throat> to, to, yeah, to be whatever they want, they, yeah, to, to, to private, right? Sorry. <laughs> so we use open source a lot to meet that goal. And we're very excited to be here now with, uh, with this new, new excitement on, on, on OpenDF. We use Terraform a lot. We, we try to, as a platform engineer, um, we try to reduce complexity using Terraform not just for infrastructure, but for any kind of um, cloud resource we managed. And we believe that OpenTofu is a game change in the next step on the IAC ecosystem. So yeah, we believe that op uh, OpenTofu is going to bring power, is going gonna, is gonna to empower not only individuals, but also enterprises. And yeah, um, apart from that, ExpressVPN also believes a lot on open source. That's, that's why we open our core. Uh, we call it Lightware Core. Um, everybody can use it. It's a, it's a, it's a different protocol. Um, and with that, with that in mind, we believe that we can contribute a lot, not just use OpenTF, but also contribute with maybe ideas, 
maybe we can also contribute some code. But yeah, game on. We're, yeah, we're awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to the ideas and the contributions and all of that. Thank, Thank you. So you. Um, <clears throat> so the, the Lint Foundation is an amazing place for, for any software project. Uh, they provided um, OpenTofu with a, an amazing governance framework to make sure that uh, across organizations, across sometimes competing interests, that, we, that uh, everyone can come together and, and make a great project. And so there's, uh, they, they've, they, they provided just a fantastic framework for that. There's the Technical Steering Committee, which if, if you're not familiar with that, that's kind of like a Supreme Court for technical arguments with, for any disagreements on the, the, the vision or the direction for the project. Um, the Linux Foundation's also provided us with uh, other things for like um, security and legal governance. And just, it's an amazing place for, um, for, for hosting and governing a, a, a project as, as important and critical, critical as this one. Um, there's a number of things that, uh, that uh, you know, I'm a developer, I'm sure you guys are developers too. Uh, the next big thing here is an official release um, that will come very soon. Uh, the, but right now, the, uh, the repository is open. And, and so if that's a first phase, just getting a release out, that's a drop-in replacement. The next phase is starting to pull, uh, via an RFC process, uh, ideas from the community and um, features, improvements, and start drawing upon the brains of folks all over the, uh, all over the world to, uh, to, to make uh, a fantastic project. And all the while ma maintaining that backwards compatibility to make sure that you can, you can use and, and migrate to OpenTofu at, at your own speed. Um, and uh, <clears throat> with that said, a uh, little call to action here. There's a talk tomorrow uh, at, on the, at 3 p.m. Please do not miss it. Uh, there's going to be two developers uh, that will answer whatever questions you have, as well as provide a little bit more information on the, the vision for the, the project, uh, how we govern it in more detail, et cetera. And there's a QR code as well. Um, if you use that, it'll take you to the Slack community where uh, we're, uh, we're all talking about the project and what, what to do, how to self-organize and all of that. So uh, please consider joining that community as well. Thank you very much. To seeing amazing outcomes from this project, and you know, we talked about that sweet spot of open governance and open code. And you know, last year, uh, Meta contributed PyTorch to the Linux Foundation as well. So TensorFlow and PyTorch were somewhat similar in that they were open source, and they're you know both great open source projects. Google is a incredibly good steward of open source, but in this case, TensorFlow is owned and managed and controlled by Google. Meta decided to contribute to the Linux Foundation, uh, their, tech, their technology, and just in one year, we've already seen what happens when you hit that sweet spot of open source and open governance. I expect we'll see the same thing from the Open Tofu project. So what we've seen is that what we thought was this big, terrible trend in open source around license changes has a pretty straightforward reaction to it, and the sky is not necessarily falling. So the next big thing that I've been hearing a lot about is, what are we going to do about open source and AI, right? What's the role of open source in large language models? You know, what are, should we even have open source large language models? Everything is terrible. And what I can tell you is, uh, Large language models, things like all of the great technology we're seeing out there around generative AI are largely built on open source components. And while the sky is not falling, I think we're seeing more and more open code, I do think there are some things that we should all think about around uh, large language models, and we should resist some calls that we've been seeing out there uh, to regulate or restrict open source large language models. Uh, recently, we've heard from different people around the world, uh, largely folks that already have a lot of capital, a lot of GPUs, and good foundation models, that we need to take a six-month pause on all this stuff until we figure it out. Uh, we're even hearing calls for folks who are saying, hey, this large language model technology, this advanced AI technology is so powerful that in 20 years in the hands of individual actors, 
people could do terrible things, create bioweapons, you, know, uh, you know, create massive cyber attacks and so forth. Uh, and what I'm telling you folks today is that kind of fear and that kind of concern that the availability of open source large language models would create some terrible outcome simply isn't true. That open source always creates sunshine. And that fear has a counterbalance around hope. Because it's not just bad things people do with large language models, it's good things too. Like discovering advanced uh, drugs, you know, uh, helping to manufacturing to become more efficient, uh, using large language models to create more environmentally friendly building and construction. Like for every action, there can be a reaction. And we're already seeing open source immediately start to tackle some of these things people are concerned about when it comes to AI. Because there are things we should legitimately be concerned about when it comes to large language models. Job displacement, bias in these models, hallucinations, security implications. These are real concerns. But those concerns aren't going to be addressed well by simply trying to ban open source large language models. What's more likely is that the open source community, and you're going to hear a little more about this later, is going to create tools that root out bias, that can answer some of these ethical complaints, that you, genuine concerns. And the open source community can also work with regulators to address those things. You see, we've seen this movie before around trying to ban open source uh, in certain areas of technology, and we know how it ends. And that was cryptography in the 1990s. How many people here remember when we were, the US government treated cryptography as a munition? And the concern was, oh, you know, if we have open source cryptography, it's going to be uh, terrible. We need to lock this down. We need to have security through obscurity. And Phil Zimmerman, an open source developer who published some cryptography code, actually was arrested. And, you know, a uh, series of court battles uh, went underway. And the way it actually ended is Phil was exonerated. Open source was seen in the United States as free speech. And what we learned was, if we try to lock everything down, people who don't care about ethics are just going to go work on cryptography anyway. Uh, open source is not something as a digital, instantly distributable good, something that can be easily contained, and that it's better to have this stuff in the open and to work collectively for our collective good than to try and control it and lock it down. Let's not repeat that mistake. Open source and AI allows for better examination of how these large language models work. It allows for better collaboration and knowledge sharing about how we can work technologically to solve some of these big challenges around it. And democratization of access to these tools largely gets better positive outcomes than the concerns around the negative outcomes. And the same holds for open data. You know, data and code are essential in building large language models. And we need to make sure that we have both of those things open. This is why the Linux Foundation created our community data license. This is a common open source uh, style license for data that allows people to easily share large data sets for the creations of LLMs. Wow, we got some CDLA fans in the audience. I love it. You're my people. I love it. But I do want to ask you all to help me out with one challenge when it comes to generative AI and large language models. So I'm going to give, especially the developers in the room, some homework today. Um, this is sort of the, the left-hand side of the software supply chain, where you know, developers create code, they uh, build, and then package that code, and then it goes to an end user. This is sort of the, the writing of that code side. And my question to developers is really simple. Does any of this stuff work? How good is it? Can we use this stuff to make even more code? Right? There's all this concern around code completion tools, and that'll put developers out of jobs, and it'll be terrible. Well, I can tell you that that's very unlikely to happen. These tools are really going to be a force multiplier for the creative minds we see in the open source community. Because just code alone is not the same as context. Like Writing is not the same as thinking. 
And anybody who's worked in the open source community for a long time knows that it's the creative minds that make for great software, not just you know, generative AI style uh, source code development. So I'm asking all of you today to go check out some of these things. Our code documentation tools that are out there good? Let us know. Do these code completion tools work effectively? Are there better ways that we can do testing and debugging and fuzzing of code? And let us know. The Linux Foundation is dedicated to providing the best developer experience possible for our communities, and we really want to know how these work. And, oops, and we understand that there are concerns about these tools. Risk management around intellectual property that's already being addressed by you know, features like you know, similar code suppression, uh, using SBOMs in order to understand the provenance of where source code and the license that it uh, derived from came from, uh, and so on and so forth. So each uh, generation of these LLMs around software development are getting better. The tools are addressing concerns around intellectual property. Regulators are working on um, making this more clear in terms of what's a derivative work and so forth. But the simple thing I'd like you all to help me with is, does this stuff work, and how could we apply it to our open source communities in a way that would create better outcomes? And if we do that, I think that uh, you know, the world of open source isn't going to be catastrophic, but it's actually going to be pretty amazing. Now, as we talk about AI, there's one other big trend that's happening in the world of large language models. And that is the shift from sort of general purpose compute to accelerated computing. You know, it's ironic. How many people here love video games? Play video games. It's thanks to all of you gamers that we have large language models in the first place, right? NVIDIA back in the 90s was this, uh, you know, GPU accelerator for games. And it's, you know, they, their business was essentially made off of gaming. And this was in an era where general purpose computing, just Intel was the, the king of general purpose computing, and accelerated computing was a big, big niche. Well, today that's kind of flipped because of large language models. Accelerated GPUs are, you know, there's a two-year backlog to get this stuff. And it's becoming one of the mainstreams of how computing is done. And what this is telling us is that we need more standards that can meet the challenges of a world where, instead of general purpose hardware, we have this accelerated hardware. And that's why today we're announcing the UXL Foundation. This is a multi-architecture, multi-vendor software ecosystem for accelerated computing. It's a set of standards that unify different heterogeneous compute ecosystems around a set of open standards. Technically, we announced this yesterday, so I, I stand corrected on that. Um, this is something that's going to be uh, really impactful. It is a uh, derivative of the One API initiative, which focuses on a set of development specifications for open source projects. Uh, and I would like to introduce the folks from the UXL Foundation, uh, Rod Burns, Sanjeev, and Vivek, who are going to talk about uh, this new initiative. So why don't you come on out? <laughs> Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, it's great to be here, and we're really excited to announce this Unifies Acceleration Foundation, or UXL Foundation for short. Um, I'm also joined here by a couple of the, the founding members um, for this foundation, which is, um, which is great. Um, Jim talked a little bit about how you know, the landscape of computing is changing. Um, you know, the, the use of accelerators is, is increasing rapidly. Um, one of the challenges that developers have is that whilst they can write software for these accelerators, there's no unified way to actually do that. So what we're doing is we're getting together these organizations from across the industry um, to define an open standards and open source way to develop um, software for all accelerators. And so together, we want to build the largest open ecosystem for accelerated computing. And we're not uh, starting from a, you know, 
not starting from a clean slate, um, a blank slate. You know, we have a solid foundation to build on. Uh, Jim mentioned the One API specification, the One API projects that are open source and being contributed. Um, so we're starting from a really good place. Um, I'm joined to, uh, with me here uh, with Sanjeev uh, and Vivek. You're going to say a few words about you know, their involvement um, and why they're here. So Sanjeev. Thank you, Rod. Uh, you know, we're frequently told by our customers that it's really, really hard to write software for accelerators uh, without building a dependence on closed source proprietary technology. Right? So one of the things, the, 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 the charter of UXL is really to build a fully open source, fully open spec uh, set of software that can run anywhere on any accelerator that can be ported to anywhere and so on. So I'm Sanjeev from Intel. I'm proudly representing the team that built One API. Intel is contributing with the One API software stack to UXL, and we cannot wait to see what UXL will build with it, and can't wait for all of you to join us. So thank you. Thanks, Sanjeev. And we're also joined by uh, Vivek from Fujitsu. Uh, good, good morning. Uh, I'm Vivek here. So as uh, uh, Sanjeev uh, mentioned, uh, for us with our uh, long history in HPC, we, have, we believe UXL is going to be critical for us going forward uh, as um, you know, um, the, the amount of cost it takes, as he mentioned, uh, uh, on the software for accelerators, uh, I mean, it is it's just mind boggling and that impedes uh, the progress. So, so we are absolutely very proud to be part of this um, and, uh, and I think it's a very key initiative for us. Thanks. Thanks Vivek. And, um, as the chairperson for the steering committee for this new foundation, you know, I encourage you to, you know, come and give your comments, contributions, um, and even join us as members. Um, uh, so you can find us on the website, it's uxlfoundation.org. Take a look and uh, please get involved in some of the special interest groups. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.